Hey gang, what's up? Welcome back here to a special one hour edition of Intuitive Angling. Today we're gonna give you guys the most comprehensive flipping and pitching uh, presentation that's ever been seen on YouTube. You know, I, you know, if you guys watch the channel much, you know that my two favorite techniques are flipping and pitching and jerk baits. I'm gonna say if I had to pick one over the other, it's a, it's close, but I think that flipping and pitching is probably my favorite way to catch bass. It's the way I learned how to fish. Um, I had some great mentors early on. Uh, most every tournament I've won on the national level has been flipping and pitching. So um, I've got a lot of juice to share with you guys about flipping and pitching. So we're gonna get into this, and I can I can promise you guys if you stay through me, through, stay with me through this this entire presentation, you're gonna come out with an entirely different perspective and understanding of flipping and pitching. Okay, before we get started, guys, in, in trade for all this 50 years worth of juice I'm getting ready to give you guys, I'm just like to run down a couple different ways you guys could help support the channel here. It's a good trade-off, if you don't mind. Uh, the number one way, guys, if you want to support the channel here is go to the View, View Product Shopping tab. When you click on the video, you'll see a thing that says View Products, and it's like 30 products I put in there. I think you guys might be interested. In order for the channel to get credit, you have to click on the product one time, and then It'll take you to the site and click on that site. And uh, that's a really good way to support the channel. Another way is check out fishthemoment.com. You guys know I build lake map breakdowns, give virtual lessons. I'll give you all the information on that. I'll put all the links in the description here so you guys can get to that. Um, that's a really good way to uh, tap the channel uh, going to that fish the moment link. Also, please, if you're looking for any tackle rods and reels, boats, whatever, uh, please check out Boat Works and Bait Works here in Springfield, Missouri. I'll put the link in the description there. The greatest boat dealership and tackle store you guys have ever seen. You guys can get the bucket old school jigs there. And um, also, please check out the solarbat.com uh, link. You know, you guys can check out my RB2 signature, signature series sunglasses there at Solarbat. That's much appreciated. And finally, um, if you guys don't mind, uh, you know, if you, I mean, if you guys are interested in booking an on the water lesson with me, uh, you know, just shoot me a, a private message on my Facebook page, Randy Blockett. And the last thing, if you guys are interested in becoming a channel member, um, channel members get extra videos, aren't seen by the public every week, access to my email address. Just go to the little play icon on my YouTube homepage at the bottom right and click on Intuitive Memberships. There we go. Much appreciated. You guys sitting through the, the plugs here. Okay, guys, here it goes. I, you know, you guys watch the channel much. You know a little bit about my background. I... I credit my my entire mastery of flipping and pitching to one person. His name was Terry Thomas. He's the one that taught me how to pitch and flip. He taught me how to find bass pitching and flipping. He under, he taught me the fine points, the details uh, that I really use to win most of my tournaments. I mean, most all of the, either the regional tournaments. In fact, I think it, um, probably 95% of the regional and national tournaments I've won have come flipping and pitching partially due to what Terry taught me and partially due to, you know, what I've discovered on my own and formulating my own system. First of all, I think one of the things that you have to realize about pitching and flipping is there, it's a pretty complex, uh, there's, it's a complex technique in the, in the sense that there's a lot of different factors to it. You have the number one factor in pitching and flipping is accuracy. Like I said, you got that. We're going to talk about you got to know where to do that. You've got to understand how to break down cover and, and understand how bass are positioned within cover. And then one of the most important aspects is you have to know what to flip as far as the bait goes. Flipping and pitching is a, is a really key bait specific technique in terms of the bass really get locked into different profiles, different colors, different fall rates based upon a lot of different factors with the cover, the water clarity, water temperatures and so forth. So we're going to get into to all, to all this in detail. So first of all, I'm going to I'm going to sort of systematically go through this and the stuff that I would recommend. The number one thing that you have to do b before you're going to have success pitching and flipping is you got to get good at the actual technique of pitching and flipping. the The only thing that you can really do, guys, in order to uh, you know learn how to do this is practice. Um, one of the things, you, you know, if, if you can't get to the lake, you can do it in your backyard. If you go to the lake, that's actually a little bit better because you're actually on the platform you're going to be pitching and flipping by. But the thing that you have to do is you have to keep practicing that technique 
to where you can put that bait where you want that bait fairly quietly at a low angle. So I can't stress this enough because if you can't get that bait in that sweet spot to where that piece of cover is, I don't care if you're flipping a dock or a bush or a lay down tree, they're in flipping and pitching most of the time, you have a small bite window and you have to be able to get that bait in that particular window um, quietly and you get it in there accurately. The more that you do that, the more that you're gonna have success with it. That is the thing that separates the people that are really good pitchers and flippers against people that are just average at it or have just moderate success is that casting accuracy. So the thing that you have to do about it, you have to match, you have to master the, the pitching and flipping skills, you know, uh, with like this, and then you have to master just the flipping skills where you hold the line in one hand and you flip. That's more old school. You will not use that near as much because you have to be in real close proximity to the fish. So the only time that I'm actually, you know, with the line flipping and pitching like that, using the line, is if I'm flipping mats or if I'm fish, fishing extremely heavy cover in dirty water, like it's cover that is like super, super gnarly vines and bushes and that type of stuff. Most of the time I'm pitching and flipping. Here's another thing about the, the, uh, the skill level as far as pitching and flipping, guys. You have to learn to be ambidextrous with it. Um, if you learn to become ambidextrous and use your right hand and your left hand, what you can do is when you're working down a, a section of bank, you know, you can just flip with one hand like this on the right hand side, you know, with your right hand and then, then work it. And all of a sudden, if you see a target over here, you can take your rod in your left hand and make a pitch with your left hand, work it like that. See another target to your right, switch your rod, make a right hand pitch. And by learning to cast ambidextrous, the flow and the rhythm and the art form of pitching and flipping becomes effortless and 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 the efficiency is accentuated a hundred percent now everybody out there can do this i don't care if you're left-handed right-handed whatever you can learn to be ambidextrous it will serve you so much better um, if you just learn that so Number one, guys, above anything else before we get into the meat and potatoes of this is you have got to learn to be able to be a good pitcher and flipper. It just takes practice. So don't ever uh, underestimate that. I, you know, I do on the water lessons with pitching and flipping a lot in the spring and summertime. And a lot of these guys that I take out, the fish can be biting really, really good, but they just can't catch any fish because they simply cannot put the bait where it needs to be. They're, you know, they're either three or four feet short, they're three or four feet over, you know, they're loud when they put it in there, and you cannot do that. So practice, 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 guys. That's the number one thing. Get your skills down, and then you can use this other stuff that I'm talking about. That's, that's the main thing. Another thing before we get into this other stuff, we'll talk a little bit about, about tackle and equipment with that. Um, most of the time, you know, I like, you know, well, not most of the time, all the time, I use that Mega Bass Alkley's Flipping Stick. And this is a medium heavy action, uh, seven foot, uh, six inch rod. Uh, you know, you don't want a broomstick. You don't want a flipping stick that's got like, it's just stiff as a board up there. You want a little bit of a tip on that because if not, you'll tear the, tear the, uh, you know, the hole in the fish's mouth a lot of times on the, on the hook set. But you want a lead, you want a rod between seven, six and eight foot long, whatever's comfortable with there. And then I would recommend some type of a good high speed bait casting reel. I use a 7.5 to one uh, for all my pitching and flipping. I just like that ratio, but you definitely want to go to at least a seven to one with that. The line size we're talking about, I use C I use two different lines when I'm pitching and flipping. I use Seaguar Invisex um, for my fluorocarbon. And then in limited situations, I'll use the Seaguar Smackdown braid. There's only two situations I ever use braid. I use braid if I'm flipping matted vegetation, um, like hyacinths and matted hydrilla and that type of stuff sometimes. Or I'll use it if I'm flipping just the gnarliest, gnarliest type of cover in some pretty dirty water. Like if you're fishing flooded mesquite bushes or something where when those, and, and that they're fairly deep, so when that fish hits, a lot of times you've got so many sharp branches and vines and stickers and stuff like that, that a lot of times you can't get them out with fluorocarbon. That's the only time. Other than that, I'm using uh, the Seaguar Invisex all the time. 
Now the pound test, um, they, they vary widely because I'll use anywhere between say um, 15 to 25 pound test in Viz X4 carbon for my flipping and pitching. If I'm, flip, if I'm flipping like docks or something like that or some type of clean cover um, based upon my bait selection, I, I may downsize to 15 pound test for carbon. If I'm fishing the thicker, thicker stuff, I'm usually using 25. Most of the time, I prefer using 20 to 25 pound test line because when I'm pitching and flipping, um, I'm, it's all about power. It's all about getting those fish out of there, getting them out of the cover. So most of my pitching and flipping is done with 20 to 25 pound test line. Okay, so that's the, the technique with that. And, and like I said, you just sort of have to mix and match a little bit. One of the things I will say about pitching and flipping is I think a lot of people, they tend to go too light with their line more than anything else. If most people, you know, maybe go a little bit too heavy, but a lot of the pitchers and flippers I'm with, it seems like they, they, they use a little bit lighter line than what they should be. On braided line, I don't, I don't use 65 on braided. Most of the time on braided, I'm using 30 to 40, sometimes 50 pound test. I just don't really think there's a need for 65. I've never, I've never broke 40 or 50, let alone 65. And I just like the way it falls a little bit. Okay, the next thing guys, we're gonna talk about, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, hook selection and weight selection before we get to the, what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna break down the, the tackle and then we're gonna go into like the areas as far as what you need to look for. So I'm gonna show you my box here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn the camera off and turn it back on and show you what my box looks like here. Okay guys, here's my weight selections for my box. Now I've got anything ranging from, this is, a, this is a, like, one eighth and one sixteenth. I got mix mix of sixteenth and eighth. I've got three sixteenths. I've got quarter. I've got um, five sixteenths. Yeah, five sixteenths. I got three quarters. Or, or excuse me, five five sixteenths. Uh, no, five sixteenths. Sorry, three eighths, three quarters. And here's all my one ounce ones here. Um, this is this is my primary selection here. This is quite a few, as you can see there. But that's the the main thing on the weights. And then over here, you know, I've got my pegots here. We're, I'm gonna talk about this here in a little bit. And then I've got all my hooks here. I've got a mix of EWGs, which I don't use very often. Primarily my pitching and flipping is gonna be the straight shank, Gamagatsu, G finesses that we're gonna talk about here. Okay, so there's a couple of different things you need to remember on here. One of the biggest elements in pitching and flipping as far as generating that strike is to find the rate fall ratio. You, you've got to get the fall rate down because a lot of times the mood and the personality of the bass, it will that will greatly determine how many bites you get. And I'm not saying that you can't get bites if you don't have the, exactly the right type of sinker on, but if you can identify the weight that those fish want, it's going to help you a long time. Now, a lot of people, they've got this perception that um, you want to use the size of sinker that allows you to most efficiently fish the cover. Um, you know, so the, you know, the size of the sinker you use is going to be determined amongst the wind and the type of cover. There is an element of truth to that to some extent, but that's not my number one concern with that. My number one concern is I want to identify the mood and the personality of the bass and then go to the sinker. Because if I have to fight my sinker down, um, say my sinker's a little bit light for the cover that I'm fishing, and if I have to fight it down a little bit, but that's what the fish want, I'm gonna use that. I'll give you, give you guys a prime example. I was fishing, we were fishing that bass, I talked about this last week, we were fishing that Bassmaster Top 150 down at Lake Fall in Alabama that I missed went, that I finished second in behind Denny Brower. Uh, I was catching all my flip, fish flipping, missed one in the tournament by an ounce. And I was flipping um, thick bank grass with that. And I was flipping a tube and a jig. And most people, would would flip that thick bank grass with heavy with a heavy weight like a half ounce or three quarter i could not get any bites doing that guys i had to go to a little three sixteenths of an ounce weight just a, a really really small little weight and i had to pitch that bait in there whether it be the jig quarter ounce jig three sixteenths on the tube and i had to pitch it in there and i had to really like finesse it down through those holes but they wanted that small profile, super slow fall. That's what the fish wanted, even though it was sort of a pain in the butt to do that. So here's what you're gonna find out in general for the most part. 
the dirtier and the cooler the water that you're fishing, the lighter the sinker I like to go to. If I'm fishing off-colored water and that water or that and that water temperature is like under 60 degrees, and I consider below 60 to be cool flipping weather because I don't I don't do much pitching and flipping in, in, until that water temperature is over 50 degrees. So that 50 to 60 degree range. If that water visibility is less than two foot, I like to go light on my sinkers. I don't care what I'm flipping and pitching. I don't care if I'm flipping a bush or if I'm flipping docks or whatever. I like to stay with like a, an eighth ounce, three sixteenths, no more than a quarter ounce under those situations. <clears throat> a quarter ounce probably even too bigger. I mainly eighth ounce and three sixteenths. As the water gets cleaner and the water gets a little bit warmer, that's when you can go to a heavier sinker and you can get away with that. Because what happens is if you're fishing off colored water, when that water is cool, those fish a lot of times will use different depths of the water column. And sometimes you can get those fish to hit it on the way down with a slow fall. But if you're flipping and pitching in some fairly clean water, like water visibility over three feet, you don't hardly ever get any bites on the way down unless the water is super, super high. And like you've got 10 foot of water in flooded bushes and sometimes they'll be suspended halfway down. But most of the time in cleaner water, those fish are gonna be tucked in on the bottom and the rate of fall is not as important as getting that bait down to the bottom. So on the opposite end of the spectrum, if I'm, say if I'm fishing a clear water, a cleaner water lake, a lake that's got, you know, over three foot of visibility and the water temperature is over 80 degrees, that's when a lot of times I'll go to um, a heavier sinker, like a 3 8 up to 3 quarter ounce, depending upon the density and the thickness of the cover. So that, that's a guideline a little bit. But one of the things that I'll tell you guys about pitching and flipping for the most part, mo or a big mistake a lot of people make, is most people simply go too heavy. I All the guys I see flipping, it's like, they're, they think when you're using a lighter sinker, you're talking about using like a 3 8 ounce. I consider a 3 8 ounce a heavy sinker. So many guys out there, they go to a standard weight of a half ounce and a three quarter ounce to flip with. And I'm not saying that won't work, it can work. But if you have this mentality that you don't get bias on a weight size and you use a weight that matches the situation, you're gonna get a lot more bites and you will also get more bites, guys, most of the time, unless you're in that real clear water on going a little bit lighter. You simply, the little lighter sinker on there, I think it just gives it a little bit more realistic presentation. You're When you're not looking for a reaction strike, sometimes you're looking for a reaction strike. There's sometimes when the mood and the, back, the personality of the fish are such where you simply, you, you've got to have that fast fall, but don't rely on it all the time. I'm saying you've got to be open-minded about it and don't get locked into thinking that, you know, three quarter, one half, three quarter ounce sinkers is your go-to sinker all the time because it shouldn't be. If I, if I had one sinker size that's sort of my go-to flipping and pitching size, I'm going to say it's three sixteenths of an ounce. A lot of people say that's a little bit light. But guys, I have caught so many good fish on a 3 16th ounce sinker and a quarter ounce jig too. So just remember that a little bit. That has a, that has a really big impact on it. Another thing you got to realize too is that the, the diameter of the line and the size of your line will also impact the fall rate. So obviously, you know, the heavier line that you're using, it's going to have more drag on it. So say, say, for example, if you're using a, uh, if you're using 25 pound test fluorocarbon line on a quarter ounce sinker, you know, that's going to slow the, the fall down to almost like you were using, say, if you're using 15 pound test with an eighth ounce sinker. So remember that it's all relative to that um, with the line size. Okay. That's the uh, line size, uh, weights a little bit like that. Let's talk about hooks now. Okay, most people, guys, what I found out in my bass fishing is most people, they use the EWG type hook for almost everything. EWG type hook is okay. It's a decent hook. Most people use it because it's, it's user friendly with that. But I'm telling you right now, guys, for the most part, you want to stay away from any type of the EWG hook when you're flipping out there. I prefer a straight tank, shank hook most all the time. Um, I use the Gamagatsu G Finesse uh, trebles all the time. 
And the thing about a straight shank hook, we talked a little bit before, straight shank hook is not quite as user friendly because you sort of have to jack with it a little bit and it tends to fall down a little bit more. But if I, say for example, if I'm fishing and I get 50 bites in a day's time, if I'm using the EWG hook, if I get 50 bites in a day's time, um, I may land 40 of those bass with an EWG. And with a straight shank hook, I'll probably land 45 of those bass. You're still gonna land bass with the EWG, but your ratio is much better with a straight shank. Guys, all I gotta say is trust me on this. I have experimented with it extensively because I prefer, if I could get away with it, I would use an EWG hook because it's easier to use. The worms stay in, they stay straight better, they stay in place better. It's not that I've got some prejudice against EWGs. It's through my experience that the straight shanks work, work the best. Now here's what you wanna remember on a straight shank. We've talked about this if you've watched the channel before. Don't ever rig a straight shank hook like this when you're pitching and flipping. You know, just see I've got that thing just straight through the, the middle of the hook like this, through the middle of the worm like that. If you do this, guys, you have, this is how most people rig it and it's, this is not the way to do it. You've got a tremendous amount of plastic to penetrate there. Even if you run it through like that, you still have plastic to penetrate through. And once you do run it through there, it's gonna be harder to keep it up there. What you wanna do is you wanna just skin hook it in the side. Just, just like that, just barely skin hook it. And what happens is the worm is still straight. A lot of guys say, oh, the worm's gonna get crooked and all that stuff and, and, and spin around like that. They're, it's not gonna spin around as long as you're not you know, throwing it like a swimming worm. But what happens is when you get that bite, that hook will, pit, will, will leave the side of that worm so much easier and you simply land far more, a greater percentage of fish with that. So that's one thing about the rigging on there. Another thing I'll, I'll tell you about this guys is don't go too big with your hook. I've experimented a lot with different hook sizes and uh, here's, here's sort of the process that went through. I, I was going through a process of about 10 years ago where I, I started losing quite a few fish flipping and pitching. And most of the time I'd have a good, you know, four or five aught straight shank hook on there, you know, flipping type hook. Um, and thinking that, you know, I needed a big gaff like that to get those fish, you know, hooked and, and penetrated. And I started losing a bunch of fish. And I went to one tournament, I remember down at Grand Lake in Oklahoma, and I had a little bitty, like a, there's a tiny little, like a two watt straight shank uh, finesse worm hook that was like rusted and that type of stuff. And I didn't care if I lost fish in practice, I was shaking them off anyway. So I put that little bitty tiny hook in the worm. And when I get a bite, I try to shake the fish off and I couldn't shake them off. Every one of them, it's like they'd swim with it and I just reel it in and they'd be perfectly hooked. I wouldn't even set the hook or anything. And I started realizing and experimenting and I downsized my hook size to like a size smaller than what I think I should be using. And I started landing a lot more fish. So here's an example, guys. Here, here's like, here's a four aught straight shank worm hook. Uh, this is just the Zoom uh, Ultra Vibe here. This hook right here, that's too big right there. That is what, you don't need that. That's a four aught hook. What, what I would use in this hook for pitching and flipping would be like a smaller two aught like this. Here's the difference. I'll show you what it looks like in there. You can see the obvious difference in the size. So what I would do is I take the two aught and sort of show you the couple different advantages to this. Put that two aught in there, hook it in the side like that. That's the two aught hook in there. And there's a couple advantages. Number one, the hook's smaller, so there's less visual for the fish to key in on. You get more bites with it. And on the smaller hook, it's a smaller diameter. So you don't have to have as much uh, force in order to penetrate that hook. Also is if you hook that bass in the, in the skin of the, of the mouth on the front here, which is where you hook them a lot, um, you, you have a tendency where you don't tear that you know, fish's mouth near much with a small hook. So that's sort of some, some overviews a little bit of the uh, terminal tackle with it. Okay, now we're gonna talk about baits a little bit before we get into areas here, as far as bait specific. 
Um, bait, the bait color and profiles and types are super critical pitching and flipping. Tell you guys right off the bat is if you can get by with the fish hitting the jig, you're going to be much better off because if you can get the fish to bite a jig, your your size of your bass is going to increase about a half a pound per fish larger. Now, as far as using the jig, this is the block of old school jig we'll talk about here, is most really good flippers and pitchers, they use two things. They use jigs or they use creature baits. I prefer jigs simply because a jig will get more bites. I don't think as many people fish it. I think the more, uh, I just think the bigger fish will hit it on average. You, and you're gonna sacrifice bites for <clears throat> the size on there. But if you're in a, a tournament situation all you're caring about is catching a limb of the fish a limb of the five fish so if my rule of thumb is like if i can average one bite per hour on a jig i'm going to stay with the jig because in if i get one bite per hour that's going to be eight fish during the day that's my limit they're going to weigh uh, considerably more they're going to weigh two to four or five pounds more on that limit than they would if it was fishing a soft plastic so try to stay with your jig Another thing you're going to find out about, there's two different color type of area, two, two different colors on jigs. You're, you're going to have your uh, browns like, excuse me, your browns like this and your, and your dark, your blacks. I'm going to rig both of them up here. This is, and the jig color selection is a little bit more limited than the soft plastics. That's why a lot of people don't use jigs much. You simply don't have that color option. But I, I, I keep it simple because when I'm jig fishing, I've got two different color palettes usually. I've got usually a black, some type of a black primary jig with a dark trailer. And I will use this in more off-colored water situations, say if that water visibility is under two feet. Most of the time, guys, if you can get the fish to bite a black jig, some type of a black, black and blue, black and chartreuse, your bass are going to be larger than they will if you use more of a brown or a green pumpkin. There's just something about a dark jig, again, it's gonna upsize the fish size. So my number one choice when I'm jig fishing is I want a dark jig like this block of old school black and chartreuse. Um, it's simply, you get a lot bigger fish on it. But the thing about it is if you go to like the browns or the green pumpkins, you're gonna get twice the bites on it. It's just a brown and a green pumpkin is more natural in the water. It blends in a little bit more. Um, the, it's for, for whatever reason, the fish will bite a more of a natural color jig than they will a black, uh, more often, but not the, not the size of the fish. So most of the time I let the water clarity dictate. If I'm fishing, my general rule of thumb is if I'm fishing a water visibility of less than two foot, I try to get them on some type of a black color. And if I'm fishing over two foot, I'm going to some type of a brown or green pumpkin combination. Uh, color is pretty much the same way. I use four different four or four primary sizes in my jigs, and two, well, actually three, three primary sizes and two uh, sizes occasionally. A quarter ounce, a three eighths ounce, and a five eighths ounce are my three go-to uh, sizes most of the time. In a rare occasion, I will use an eighth ounce jig. And if you can't find an eighth ounce jig, you can take like one of my jigs and you can file the head down, like file half of the, the weight on it and get it down to an eighth ounce pretty easy. And I'll go, let me start on, on light and I'll go heavier. The light jig situation is for that really off colored, shallow, really dirty water. So if I'm, if I'm flipping, pitching a jig and water visibility to say, you know, three, four inches visibility like that, which I've caught a ton of fish on that dirty water in a jig. I use a eighth ounce jig a bunch. I'll, just, I'll use a full size skirt, eighth ounce head, full size trailer, and that jig's gonna fall super slow like that. And it's almost like it's just sort of floating down in the water. And in that off color dirty water, fishing around stumps, whatever, it can be really productive at times. And the same with the weights on the soft plastics. As my water clarity and my water depth and my water temperature increases, that's when I'm going to a little bit heavier. If I can get away with it, I like a 5 8 ounce jig. A 5 8 ounce jig, um, like I said, you can fish it fast, you can fish it very effectively. There's something about the bigger fish like a 5 8 ounce. Out of all the jig sizes I've caught fish on, 
I've caught more big ones on the 5 8 ounce jig than any other size. Um, 3 8 ounce is probably the most common size most people use. It's just a, it's a good all around size. It skips and you can skip it and flip it. Skip it under docks. You can pitch it and flip it really good. It's just a, a really good versatile size. And then occasionally I will go up to the one ounce model. We're we're also we're coming out. In fact, we've got it out now. It'll be out in the next you know few weeks. That uh, block of old school one ounce model. The one ounce model. The times that I use that is if I'm flipping and pitching mainly in pretty hot water. If I'm, water water temperature for the one ounce jig for me needs to be like over 80 degrees. But my favorite time to fish a big one ounce jig is. In the, like in the dead of the summer, if the water is say you know anything over 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 two foot deep, I like to go to that one ounce jig to get that reaction strike. And also, one ounce jig works really good in any type of, of emergent or submergent vegetation. So, all you guys fish, fishing in Florida, you know flipping reeds and buggy whips, that one ounce jig is hard to beat down there. If you're flipping and pitching uh, some type of hydrilla or matted milfoil. One ounce jigs hard to beat in that situation, but that's that's the main uh, considerations with jigs. Now I will I will flip a finesse jig some, um, you know, any type of a like a smaller ball size jig. Specifically, when I'm flip, flipping and pitching the ball size or smaller finesse jig, <clears throat> I'm usually either pitching it and flipping it to bare rock like bluffs, you know, steep banks like that, or around boat docks. Those are about the two main scenarios that I'll use a finesse jig. And if I'm using a finesse jig, pitching and flipping, most of the time it's like some type of a heavier cover finesse jig. It's got a little bit beefier hook in it, and I'll usually put it on anywhere between 12 to 17 pound test Seaguar and Vizex. Um, but if I'm flipping and pitching, I don't like to use a finesse jig. I would rather use my number one deal that I try to get going is a jig bite. I'm, a, I'm after the right color and the right size, the right you know trailer setup. That's a, one thing real quick I forgot to mention on the trailer setup is trailers also have a big impact on it. I prefer either like that Popeye's pork frog or the Zoom big salty chunk. I like to hang a chunk off of my jig. A lot of guys like to thread you know, some type of a trailer up there, like a rage craw. I'm not a big fan of that. Even even on like the Zoom Super Chunk, something like this, a lot of guys thread it on there up the shank. Guys, I prefer hanging it off the end like that. I, I've just caught more, a lot more fish on this type of a setup. It's sort of a confidence thing to me, <clears throat> but you sort of have to use what's working for you a little bit. <clears throat> okay, let's get into soft plastics a little bit here. Now I'm I'm going I'm actually I'm going through this a little bit fast simply because I know you guys can't sit here all day long and watch a video, so I'm I'm sort of I'm sort of just touching the highlights because I could do a one hour seminar just on jigs, just on trailers and colors and stuff like that. So I'm trying to get through this as we as fast as we can. You've, okay, now the soft plastics. Let's talk, talk a little bit about that. When you're talking flipping and pitching soft plastics, we've already talked about the sinker and the hooks. Let's talk about the specific uh, profiles and colors of soft plastics. You need to think in terms of three three different terms overall. You need to think of some type of a, like a creature bait, like the Zoom Z Craw, or some type of a soft plastic stick bait. This is that Zoom Zlinky, or just a plastic worm. You know, the, the, those are going to be the three primary categories. Now you're going to have some variations like the Zoom Trick Worm and you know you, you know flat the flap and speed cross something like that. There's going to be three primary variations, but when you're talking in terms of trying to figure out what the bass want, think in those terms of creature bait, um, traditional plastic worm, and a soft plastic stick bait. I'll tell you one thing, guys, right off the bat, which a lot of people don't consider pitching and flipping. A soft plastic stick bait like this Zinky, Zoom Zlinky, or Cinco, or something like this. Guys, this is deadly. It is a deadly pitching and flipping bait. I mean, I have caught so many bass pitching and flipping on this and just a wide range of cover. You definitely want to put this into your arsenal if you haven't been pitching and flipping with it. The key on this, though, if you're flipping and pitching a soft plastic stick bait, it's all about downsizing that sinker. Most of the time, I'm flipping it on a sixteenth or one ounce, or excuse me, a sixteenth or one eighth ounce sinker. I don't ever go heavier than that. I guys, I cannot, I could not put 
the bass in my backyard, how many I've caught on a soft plastic stick bait, flipping it with an eighth ounce sinker. An eighth ounce sinker with like 17 or 20 pound test line falls fairly fast on there. It penetrates cover good. It gets a lot of bites. And the biggest, the biggest bass I ever caught in my life it was over 11 pounds down at Lake Okeechobee on a soft plastic stick bait, pitching it and flipping it. <clears throat> big ones will bite it. <clears throat> Not only will big ones bite it, but a lot of fish will bite it. It is just a great bait to pitch and flip with. <clears throat> Next one, guys, just the, the plastic worm. Um, any type of plastic worm, it doesn't matter if, if it's like a trick worm, straight worm, or if it's a curl tail like this, um, these are hard to beat too. Uh, Flipping and, plistin, flipping and pitching pla plastic worms, when I'm thinking in terms of that, I'm usually thinking and thinking the, the fishing is a little bit tough. The only time that I go to a plastic worm to flip is if, it, if I think that the fish are positioned to be caught flipping and pitching, but for some reason it's a little bit tougher. Say, for example, the lake doesn't have a lot of fish in it in general, or it's post-cold front, or there's a lot of fishing pressure, or it's something that the fish have just seen a lot of baits. Then I'll go to a plastic worm. One of my big secrets in tournament fishing that I've always had is I, I've, I've had a lot of success, guys, if I'll go through an area with a jig, like I'll make, I'll make one pass with a big jig, and then I'll come back through it with a plastic worm. Uh, the last Bassmaster Top 150 tournament I won down at, Lake Mo at the Mobile Delta in Alabama, that was my strategy. I went through the area with the jig first and I mopped them up with a Texas rig plastic worm. That's worked many, many times for me like that. So think in terms of going to a plastic worm uh, if you think the fish are a little bit tougher. Now the next category is your creature baits. You know, like the, uh, you know, the brush hog, any type of a beaver or something like this, I consider it a creature bait. It is the most popular flipping bait out there. This, most people that don't, know a lot about pitching and flipping, they immediately go to a beaver or something like that. That's just their go-to flipping bait. And it's highly productive, don't get me wrong. Beaver style or creature bait like that is highly productive. Works in a lot of different situations. It works in the thickest cover, it works in sparse cover. It's a really good pitching and flipping bait. I simply try to stay away from it. One of the reasons that I try to stay away from a creature bait is it's simply the bass see it so much. That's why one of the tips I'll give you that I use on my own is I either stay with a jig or a worm or a soft plastic stick bait. I rarely go to a creature bait for my pitching and flipping. The only time that I go to a creature bait really is if I'm in an area where I think there's a lot of bass that have not got a lot of pressure. That's when I'll go to a creature bait. A creature bait also some a creature bait will also work better as the season goes on a little bit. It seems like for something about uh, you know when you start to get like an August September when the when the fishing is a little bit tougher or something like that, I can go to a creature bait and catch some fish. Um, doesn't really make much sense because if you think those fish are pressured, they'd want a plastic worm. But this is just something I've noticed as a trend. And another thing I'll notice about a creature bait, guys, is I that is when I do go a little bit heavier on my sinker. I've had a lot more success on creature baits going heavier than what I normally would on my jigs or my or my straight tail plastic worms or something like that. So if I'm fishing a creature bait, I'm usually using it on a half ounce to three quarter ounce sinker for some reason. That's just by, been my primary go-to with that. So um Anyway, guys, without getting into another hour-long seminar here, uh, that's a pretty good foundation to guys give you a start with your pitching and flipping. I think I hear Elijah starting to come in back there. Um, like I said, feel free to drop me some comments. You know, I'd be happy to answer them with that, but I think that's going to give you guys a really strong foundation to begin uh, pitching and flipping if you don't know much about it, or even if you do, it may, may have learned something there too. Also, one quick thing here, let's talk real quick about soft plastic colors. It's the same thing with your jigs, guys. Let the water clarity dictate the color. Less than two foot visibility, go to the dark colors. Over two foot visibility, go to the natural colors. And that seems to be a pretty good rule of thumb. So anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, pitching and flipping, so usually for me, it starts in March sometime, lasts up until November. Just a super fun way to catch them. Again, thanks for tuning in, uh, much appreciated. And please check out those links to the uh, stuff that I was talking about with the channel, it'll be much appreciated and we'll talk later, see ya.